Lou is a, is a philosopher. He's written a very, uh, an excellent book called Plato, Not Prozac, and the latest is The Middle Way. However, before we get into that, far, far more important, Lou is a table hockey champion. So without further ado, I give you Lou Marinoff. Lou. Let me just spend five minutes with you about table hockey. We're talking about scale and essence. You know, th these are reductions of sports, right? Foosball is the name for table football. I'm in Europe now, so I'm saying football, not soccer. But this is, you know, the big sport is football, and the reduction is called foosball. Ping pong is called table tennis, yes? Table tennis. It's a reduction of the sport of tennis. And similarly, table hockey is a reduction of the sport of ice hockey. But please don't make the mistake of thinking that these miniaturizations are therefore toys, they're not. They're games and sports and part of industries. There is an industry of ping pong. There is going to be an industry of table hockey when I'm through with it. We had a golden era in Canada in the 1950s through the 1980s was the golden era of table hockey. Golden in more ways than once. Over 12 million units were sold in Canada alone during that time in a country with, which had only 20 million people. So every house had several of these and it was a great game for kids. A great game for kids and for brothers, and sisters too. Girls had to play, the brothers were playing, sometimes they had to play. But it was a great game for children, okay? And what happened, the children grew up, and we formed leagues, and we got sponsorship, and we became really good, and that, that's the Montreal Table Hockey League back in the 1980s. You see that guy on the right? He was a champion, league champion for six years, Canadian Open champion three years in a row. And believe me, that required some excellence. There were some really great players in those days. And beating them all required excellence. They were excellent themselves. So that's, that's another story, okay? What happened is that those are the two greatest games ever made. The Monroe was made in the U.S. with Bobby Orr on the cover. And the Coleco was made in Canada with the kids on the cover. You can see they got the packaging wrong already. You mar you're marketing experts. You understand the package is completely wrong. Why? Because NHL hockey players aren't any good at table hockey. Bobby Orr, as great as he was on the ice, would get creamed by any of us on a table hockey game. No contest at all. And in fact, too bad for him, he was such a great hockey player, his knees gave out. He had to retire because of bad knees. If he were playing table hockey, he'd still be great today. Okay? And this other package, you know, with the kids, it's not a toy. The, a lot of manufacturers only understood it as a toy, so they pitched it as a toy. And they put kids on the box instead of pros. That's another mistake. What happened to them? They went to sleep. In 1982, I went and talked to the vice president of marketing for Coleco, and I said, listen, this is an industry. We have professionals playing. We have leagues in every city. We've got to make this happen. He said, yes, Lou, I, I get it, and we, we should do this, but we're not going to do this because we have a better idea. We're going into electronics. Well, that was the thing. Has anybody ever heard of ColecoVision? I rest my case. <laughs> they, went, they went into electronics. They went out of business within two years. They, couldn't, they were worse than Atari. Uh, okay, ColecoVision was a worse product than you're laughing. Some of you were laughing at Atari. You should. Atari, was, of course, couldn't compete with Nintendo. So Coleco disappeared off the map. They didn't listen to me. They could still... I'm serious. If they'd listened to me, they would, they would be making games worldwide now. Okay? This is what happened. Stiga. Any Swedish people here? Okay, so you know about Stiga. You have a monopoly right now. By default, you have a monopoly. And this is how big it's getting. This is the turn of the century. Look at that. That's huge. Okay? These are hundreds of people playing, and Stiga is selling about 300k units a year, mostly in the EU. Mostly in the EU, and the reason is that North Americans don't like their, their, their model. We, have, we think a better model. But anyway, the point is they have a monopoly, and they're doing great. And that's because they understand that the game is a sport, and they have helped to turn it into an industry. So congratulations to Stiga for filling a void, basically. No competition. That should say something to you. you. You guys are marketing experts. What do you mean, no competition? We can't allow this to happen. So that's Stiga. And these are the, the countries. Every country where they play ice hockey, they play table hockey. Every country where they play any form of hockey. In India, they play field hockey. They could play table hockey. Any country where any form of hockey is played, they will play table hockey. Plato would tell you this. He taught Aristotle. He knew. 2004 was a watershed year for table hockey. The Canadians made a movie about it because they realized the Swedes had now captured this huge market share in Europe and had a little industry going, certainly a sport, not quite an industry, but a big sport. Canada had fallen into disarray. 
They made a documentary movie. They discovered me. I got featured in it. It's been aired repeatedly on Canadian national television, telling the story of table hockey and trying to get North Americans roused to get back into the market, okay? Then I found, this is every man's dream, right? I found myself on the front page of the sports section of the Toronto Star. It's totally unbelievable. I mean, maybe some women too, but this is the Aristotelian thing, right? We want to be on the front page of the sports section. Now I can retire. Oh, not quite. But anyway, that was, that was a phenomenal thing with a sports illustrated photographer coming and doing it. I felt just like an athlete at that point. Okay, that was a great thing for table hockey. Now it's making a comeback. Martin LaBelle has built a custom table. His son is playing again. We have great champions emerging on this board. The guy at the bottom right is recovering from a stroke. That's my friend in Vancouver. This is a great thing for him to be doing. It's not computer games. Do you understand? These computer games are not real. The opponent is not real. There's no social contact. Kids are getting disconnected. They're getting cognitively impaired from too much video. I'm absolutely serious about this. Table hockey exercises the large motor skills as well as the fine ones. And it also provides social contact and a matrix for respecting one's opponent and promoting the virtues of sportsmanship. It's a real game. It's also good for people recovering from strokes. It gets them to use their motor skills in a very constructive way. So that's what's happening. As John said, it's true. I'm on the comeback trail. 24 years later, I'm a better player than I was. I am. It's true. Because the ABCs have helped me to become a better player. And I hope they'll help you to become better at what you do, too. So this is what we need. Table hockey, not Prozac. This is my challenge to you, OK? Help me get this into the market. Thank you very much. This is. You appreciate this? Thank you. That's, I, I really love that because our kids need this. This is a gift for life for them. It really is. And better than drugs, believe me. It's much. I, I was a hippie, I know. It's, this is better, okay? <laughs> and this is a lifelong gift we could be giving to children. And children from all over the world could be playing together. It's not going to resolve all the world's problems, but we'll do some good where some good needs to be done. And we have three segments for you experts out there. The U.S.-Canada segment, we just have to relight the fire, okay? We had millions of units in the market. We just need a game to get it back into the market. People will buy it. All the players will promote it. They'll love it. EU, we have to contest. Stig, it's a monopoly. We can't let this happen. we got to do something, right? And the Asian segment is totally unknown. If this game ever takes off in China, then the numbers will crunch us. We won't have to crunch any numbers at all. Now look, questions, thoughts, challenges. Hey, my name is Darini. I'm from MarketWise in Bangkok, Thailand. I just wanted to say that I grew up in uh, Ottawa, Canada in the late 60s and the early 70s. So I support everything you say about table hockey because I was <laughs> a big fan of table hockey and I grew up in the Bobby Orr era. And so I haven't played for 30 years, but I'm volunteering to take care of the Asian segment for you. <laughs> great, and women. That is so great. See, this is, this is every pitch man's dream. To have this. She is not a shill. We did not plant her. Thank you so much, Eric. The truth is that women can play this game really well, really well and very competitively. And like tennis, you can have doubles and mixed doubles. You know, so men and women can play. And that, that's next year. Next year, we'll play some table hockey together, okay? <laughs> Lou, thank you. Go on. Thanks, terrific. John. Pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.